Thank you, thank you very much. And don't forget, this video was made possible by my patrons on Patreon. Want to support me? The link is on the screen. Sincerely yours, Visual Pony, and enjoy this audiobook. Project Sunflower, Chapter 2 Gathering Data Conference Room 4C turned out to be one of the larger rooms, dominated by a large oak table. Aaron and the other four volunteers shuffled in, full of cake and high spirits. She was a bit alarmed to see two armed guards standing on either side of the door, but they didn't try to stop them going in. There were a number of people waiting for them, all grouped at the far end away from the door, relaxing and chatting in the high-backed black leather chairs. The volunteers were encouraged to have seats close to the current occupants, leaving most of the room empty. We were really hoping for a few more volunteers said one of the people in the room, a scientist Aaron recognized as Dr. Maggie Hansen, who was her boss's boss and head of the harmonics emitter team. She turned to one of her fellow scientists and added, I told Paul we should have expanded our selection beyond just the interns. The other scientist shrugged. He said he wanted to keep it in-house. There didn't seem to be much to say to that, so Aaron fiddled with the paperwork Dr. Velchek had given her as the others introduced themselves. In addition to Dr. Hansen, there was a Dr. Alden Rowe, Chief of Medicine, Dr. Herman Fisher, who was in charge of something apparently called Project Ascent, and who spoke with a slight Austrian accent, and a short, thin, middle-aged man who didn't give his first name and simply identified himself as Dr. Edwards. The last man to introduce himself was Major Mitchell Morris, who said he was there as a military observer. As the introductions were wrapping up, Dr. Velchiak walked in and seated himself at the head of the table. Have we all already introduced ourselves to each other? Yes? Good. Let's get right into it then. First and foremost, did you all have a chance to go through your paperwork? The volunteers all assured him they had. Good deal, Dr. Velchiek said, beaming. First thing then, is that we need you all to sign the confidentiality agreement. Basic non-disclosure under penalty of treason of any information that you may be told in here. Do any of you have any questions? No? Then sign away, my wonderful volunteers! Aaron felt a bit nervous and, judging by the looks on their faces, so did the others. However, with only a slight amount of hesitation, she and the others all signed the documents and handed them over to Dr. Velchiak. Good, he said as he gathered the papers together into a manila folder. Now that that is out of the way, I have to say that we are going to be introducing you to some very radical concepts here. Not only the cybernetic implants, which I touched upon very briefly during the meeting, but some cutting-edge stuff that anyone out in the world today would tell you is nothing but science fiction. I have to warn you that there's no going back after this point. You can still refuse to participate once you hear the offer, but if you decline, you will be kept separate from the rest of the personnel on site. That's non-negotiable, I'm afraid. Your only contact will be with other people who have the same information that you do. At least until this particular project has run its course. And you wish to leave may do so now, with no hard feelings, and go back to the scanner arrays. Aaron could see the fear in the eyes of the other interns, and she was sure they could see the same in hers. One of the volunteers got up, a woman perhaps in her late twenties. She made her excuses, blushing furiously, and then walked quickly out the door. A guard poked his head into the conference room, but Dr. Velchiek shook his head and said that she was free to go. The guard nodded and closed the door again. Uh, well, Dr. Velchiek said, not as bad as I was expecting. Well, if the rest of you are very sure, good. Then let's get into some of the data that we know. Dr. Velchia clicked a button on the table in front of him and the lights in the room dimmed. 
A screen at the back of the room lit up and suddenly filled with the same pastoral scene that Aaron remembered first seeing when Pony World was introduced. There were a few things that we kept from the others. We collected some video and carefully edited it to keep out some of the more extraordinary aspects of this world. First of all, here you see one of the horned ponies, what most of my stuff here are calling a unicorn, which seems apt enough. What you didn't see was... Well, just watch. Aaron watched carefully as the pony trotted into view, smiling gently as she trotted along. Now that she got a closer look, she noticed that the pony looked only superficially like a pony from Earth. This one's head was rounder, with larger eyes and a higher forehead. Also, horses and ponies on Earth didn't smile, in her experience. Nor did they have what looked like a tattoo of a four-leafed clover on their rumps. Also, something else seemed slightly off about her. Aaron blinked and then suddenly noticed that the unicorn's horn was glowing slightly. A pale green a shade or two lighter than her coat. Then, something amazing happened. Several branches on the ground were enveloped in a similar colored glow and then rose into the air and sped towards the unicorn. She turned and trotted back the way she came, branches in tow. Aaron became aware that her mouth was hanging open, so she shut it. As you can see, the unicorns seem to possess a telekinetic ability. We suspect that the winged ponies also have some sort of TK ability as well, which enables them to fly. As you can see, there's simply no way that their wingspan, even in Pony World's slightly lower gravity, could support a creature of that size. At least, not without the creature being so light that its mass wouldn't be able to overcome air resistance to allow it to move forward. This wasn't the only example of telekinesis we'd seen from these remarkable ponies, Dr. Velchiek said. We've seen many others. He tapped again on the console in front of him and the video shifted. Several unicorns flashed by on the screen above. A blue one, apparently male and with a white mane and a safety pin tattoo was trotting along with a bag full of what seemed to be apples floating beside him. A yellow one with a blue mane was using her telekinesis to put a hat on her head. And finally... There was a lavender one with a darker purple mane with a pink streak and a pattern that looked like a starburst for a tattoo. She was walking down the street and apparently reading from the book that she was levitating in front of her. Aaron's thoughts that seemed a little bit on the dangerous side. Obviously, the telekinesis prevents a great unknown factor. This is one way in which this world is different than ours. Who knows how many others there may be? How do you get all these videos? Aaron asked, amazed. Ah, uh, glad you asked. The drones that we sent over are very small, programmed to evade notice, and have simply the best cameras money can buy. They stay some distance outside of the town, zooming in on whatever their programming takes a fancy to. Sir, said Adam, what's the significance of the tattoos on their hindquarters? Ah, uh, that... Dr. Velchiak replied, scratching his beard. We honestly don't know. All of the adults have some. It seems to be some sort of ritualistic rite of passage into adultive kind of thing. But we're really not sure. We have catalogued a few of these, but there seems to be almost no correlation between the pony and the tattoo. Outside of the different types of ponies, it is. What do you mean? Aaron asked. Well, there's the three different kinds of ponies as you see. At least, if there are any other kinds, we haven't seen them yet. The basic kind is the one without horns or wings. They seem to be mostly laborers and farmers or craftsmen or crafts ponies, I suppose. They tend to have more down-to-earth kinds of marks. Various kinds of plants, fruits, flowers, tools, that sort of thing. The unicorns, so they seem to have more along the lines of artistic, mystical or scientific types of marks. Stars, for example, or paintbrushes. 
I saw one with an hourglass even. The winged ponies tend to have ones based on weather, such as clouds, rainbows, that kind of thing. There is some crossing back and forth, such as the unicorn we saw earlier with the clover mark. But our best guess is that it is some kind of caste system, with the plain ponies most likely on the bottom, so there doesn't seem to be any real social separation between the classes. Aaron was fascinated. There were so many unknowns. So, basically, Dr. Velchia continued, we want you to go and infiltrate pony society. Find out how things work there. Try the local food so you can give the sensors we'll implant in your digestive tracts the ability to analyze the nutritional content of it. Mingle with the ponies, learn how the economy works, what the difference is between the classes of ponies besides the obvious. Find out how the government works, that kind of thing. Basically, just get any and all information that you can as quickly as you can. Adam laughed briefly. And how are we supposed to do that? Just walk up to them and say, Hi there, little ponies. I'm an alien that wants to gather information about your world. How would they even understand us? I doubt they speak English. That's one of the amazing things, Dr. Velchik replied. Chuckling. One of the probes we managed to get across happened to pick up a brief conversation as a couple of ponies wandered by underneath it. Apparently, they speak perfect English. Honestly, I was still too shocked by the telekinesis to be much bothered about that. But it is, perhaps, the most astounding thing, I'm sure you'll agree. As for the other thing, he said, clearing his throat and looking mildly uncomfortable. You won't be aliens at all. We plan to, well, to turn you into ponies. There was a long pause. I'm sorry, what? Erin said after a minute. She couldn't have heard him right. Yes, into ponies. Dr. Fisher, if you could take over. Certainly, Paul. The scrawny old Austrian doctor straightened in his seat and punched a button on his own control panel. The visions of Pony World and its colorful, wonderful inhabitants faded from view, to be replaced by what looked like very strange, slightly mechanical and oily-looking grains of rice. I work on Project Ascent. This project had one goal in mind, to figure out how to counter the Black Tide's nefarious little nanomachines with nanomachines under our own control. Unfortunately, the machines are much more advanced than ours, and simply consume them like they consume everything else. In any case, what you see here is the fruit of our labor. Each of these little pellets is invisible to the naked eye and yet has the ability to rearrange matter in much the same way that the tide's own nanomachine can. Only in this case, we can control it. I'm done, said the third volunteer, a young man that Aaron knew as Richard. No way that's going to work for me, sorry. This sounds way too mad scientist to me. Very well, said Dr. Valchiak, disappointment evident in his voice. He stood and escorted the young man out the door, where he murmured briefly to the guards standing outside the doorway. Richard was escorted away by one of the guards, and Dr. Valchiak returned to the head of the table, lowering into his seat with a heavy sigh. And then there were two... Please continue, Dr. Fisher. Ah, yes, of course. The Austrian fiddled with his pen briefly, obviously trying to recollect his thoughts. Finally, he continued. The procedure is perfectly safe, I assure you. We will turn you into ponies of the plain variety and give you what we hope will be an appropriate mark on your flanks. Aaron felt a brief moment of disappointment. Not that the thought of being turned into a pony by what appeared to be, admittingly, a mad scientist didn't scare the willies out of her, but... Why can't we be winged ponies? She asked. I'd like to be able to fly. Dr. Fisher seemed mildly amused by that. If you can tell us how they fly and describe for us the anatomy of their wings, he said, then indeed we'd be happy to make you over into a winged pony. As it is so, we have no idea how to replicate the abilities of the haunt and winged ponies that you see in our videos. 
Aaron was surprised to note that she was feeling disappointed by that. It wasn't like there was any chance that she would actually let these people remake her body into that of a pony. Was there? Dr. Fisher continued. We can do this, we assure you. We've already done significant animal testing and we believe we have the flaws worked out. And you have my personal word, broke in Dr. Velchiak that you will be turned back at the first opportunity when you return from Pony World. And, just to sweeten the pot, if helping to save the world isn't enough, I will personally guarantee that you will be compensated well enough that you will never have to work again. Also, you will be heroes the world over once this is all said and done. So, what do you say? Aaron exchanged a long, doubtful look with Adam. Where did this technology come from? Adam asked. I've never heard of anything like this, ever. This seems like it's years beyond anything we're capable of. Dr. Fisher looked uncomfortable. He looked at Dr. Velchiak, who shrugged and nodded. We have studied the nanomachines of the tide, Dr. Fisher confessed. We were able to retrieve some damaged ones and figure out some of the properties by which they work. Our own nanomachines were built using that knowledge. So you're saying you're planning on using technology based off of the Black Tide to turn us into ponies? Adam said flatly. Both Dr. Velchiak and Fisher confirmed that this was true. Then I also have to say no, sorry, said Adam. I agree with Richard, this is just too crazy. Sorry Aaron, looks like it's down to you. Aaron felt her heart racing as Dr. Velchiak escorted Adam out of the door and into the hands of the waiting guard outside, who took him away. And then there was one, Dr. Velchiak said as he lowered himself to his seat. What do you say, Aaron, was it? The fate of the world rests in your hands. No, the fate of two worlds. Ours and theirs. Because I guarantee you... Visa or not, we gather the information we need. Humanity is moving into Pony World in about eight months' time. We already have emitter stations going up all over the world in preparation for the event. We will plan on doing this as diplomatically as possible. But the survival of the human race has to take precedence. The information you gather could make the transition so much easier on both species. Will you do it? Sir, I... She glanced away. She never liked being put on the spot, and here she was being told that she was partially responsible for the fate of the human race. Oh, and the mostly unknown pony race, come to think of it. Why did I ever volunteer in the first place? She thought miserably. If I'd known this was going to be based on Thai technology, can I sleep on it? She asked finally. Dr. Velchiak agreed and then escorted her to the doorway himself. The others in the room went their own separate ways. One of the guards had returned by this point, but Dr. Velchiak waved him off and walked her down to a specially prepared dorm himself. The whole way he kept up a steady monologue about the good of humanity, saving the earth, and how she could be one of the heroes of the modern world much like the astronauts who walked on the moon almost a century ago. She really wished he'd stop talking. It was making it hard for her to think. Finally, they reached another guarded door. Well, here you are, my dear. I really hope you take us up on this opportunity. You'll be doing everyone a lot of good if you agree. And with that, Dr. Velchiak turned and left. Erin entered the doorway and looked around. She was in a large sitting area with several screens on the walls, though none of them were on at the moment. The central area had a large sofa and several comfortable-looking chairs. There were bookshelves around the walls, and off to one side she saw a bar and a decent-sized kitchen area. Richard and Adam looked up as she entered, apparently interrupting their conversation. Well, that didn't take long, Adam said with a grin. I didn't think anyone would go for that. It's just too crazy. Actually, Aaron said hesitantly, I haven't made up my mind yet. 
Both Richard and Adam gaped at her. You've got to be kidding, Richard said, looking astounded. They want to break your body down and recreate it. Recreate it as a stupid horse. Using technology inspired by the black tide. How can you even consider that? Because a lot of lives are at stake, that's how. Don't be stupid, Adam said, rolling his eyes. Nobody's going to die. We've got a world to move to. Getting information is pointless. We're going in Weezer or not these ponies like it. And if they fight us, well, we're not exactly leaving any of our military hardware behind, are we? I doubt those winged ponies can outfly a jet. Both he and Richard started joking about how overmatched the ponies would find themselves against fighter jets, tanks and helicopters. She thought back to the videos they had all seen. Ponies laughing and playing, talking and reading, building things, farming things, a community and one that seemed to be happy and cohesive. She had a sudden vision of what was going to happen. Ready or not, humanity was going to pour through harmonic gateways by the millions. No, by the billions. People in general weren't bad, but with the survival of the entire species at risk, would the plight of these little ponies even be considered? Almost definitely not. Not unless someone went in and came back with information. These ponies were living, sinking creatures, and unless that information came out, Aaron was afraid that they'd be treated as little better than animals by a good portion of humanity. And maybe even worse by some people. Talking animals? That would seem a threat to certain kinds of people. Aaron was convinced that most people were good and kind in the world. But even still, she knew that there were plenty of small-minded racists and xenophobes out there. If there were people that hated other people based on nothing more than skin color, how many people would hate the ponies based on actual species? The full weight of it suddenly hit her. Dr. Velciak was completely right. It was two worlds, not one, that hung in the balance. And the one that was in greater danger was Pony World. She made up her mind. Turning, she opened the door she had just walked through. The guards jumped a little and one of them raised a hand as if to bar her. Sorry ma'am, he began. But you can't leave. Please send for Dr. Velciak, she said, cutting him off. Tell him I've made up my mind. Tell him. She took a deep breath. Tell him I'll do it. And it's comment time once again, everyone, and this is Visual Pony, and I will as always remind you that you can support me via my Patreon, so link is in the description. Every dollar helps is needed and very much appreciated. So, let's get into this comment time. So, where to begin, where to begin? First of all, let's say, Richard and Adam. Those two are, in my opinion, stupid and a very bad example for what humanity would most likely do if such a situation arose. They are for simply invading, quote-unquote, pony world and not care about the plight of its inhabitants. Aaron, however, is grasping the situation here and is, in my opinion, doing the right thing. Um, and that's basically all I've got to say here because, yeah, I've got stuff to do real life, you know. So, let me know what you think about the whole thing. What would you do? Would you agree to go th uh, through an experimental procedure and basically be turned into a pony? Or would you, well, just shit on it and say, okay, let's invade. Sincerely yours, Visual Pony, and I hope you enjoyed this.